This is the story of Korean Airlines Flight 902. When you hear the phrase, passenger plane shot down by the Soviet Union, you're probably thinking about the story of Korean Airlines Flight 007, a 747 that was shot down by the Soviet Union in 1983 as it accidentally flew into the Soviet Union. We're all familiar with that story, but the story of Korean Airlines Flight 902 is lesser known and should be learned from. A brief warning before we get into the meat of the story. For this incident, I could not find an official report and instead I had to rely on translated Russian and Ukrainian documents along with a few blogs that I found on the subject. So a few small inaccuracies may creep in despite my best efforts to keep this as factual as possible. If you find something to be wrong, do let me know in the comments below. In the latter half of the 20th century, after the Second World War had ended, the two world powers emerged, namely the United States and the Soviet Union. With differing ideologies, the two were in close competition, both economically and militarily. As the Cold War started, there was deep mistrust among both superpowers. Both sides were convinced that the other would try to launch a preemptive nuclear strike on the other. So much so that the Americans kept B-52 bombers in the air at all times for eight years from 1960 to 1968. Think about that. The United States kept its bombers in the air, ready with thermonuclear weapons, ready to execute a strike at a moment's notice. It was in this atmosphere of fear and distrust that Korean Airlines Flight 902 took off from Paris to Seoul with a refueling stop in Anchorage, Alaska on the 20th of April, 1978. It was commanded by Captain Kim chang Kyu, with co-pilot S.D. Cha and navigator Lee kun Shik. Their flight path took them over or very near to the North Pole. Flying northwest from France, they would fly to Alaska, take on some fuel, and then fly down to Seoul. As they flew northwest, all was normal. Then, over the tiny town of Alert in Nunavut, the plane takes a right turn, making an almost 180 degree turn. The plane was now no longer headed for Seoul, but instead it was heading straight for the Finnish Soviet border. The plane was picked up by Soviet radars when it was about 400 kilometers out. At this time, they probably assumed that it was one of their planes or a Tupolev long range bomber that had problems with its IFF code. I assume they tried to hail the unidentified blip on their radar, but as the blip got closer and closer to the Soviet border, a decision had to be made by the Soviets. At about 9 p.m. local time, the Su-15 regiment was put on high alert. After a few minutes, the Soviets scrambled a flight of Su-15 fighters to identify the bogey from the Afrikanda Air Base near Murmansk. The Su-15 was piloted by Captain Alexander Bosov. This wasn't all that common, with NATO and the US carrying out thousands of surveillance flights near the Soviet Union. Fighters would often be scrambled to intercept planes. But as the planes scrambled to intercept the high-flying 707, the pilots of the Su-15 are told the goal is to destroy. The internal military workings of Moscow were set in motion. They're trying to figure out if this is one of their planes. They look at all the flight parameters. The target is still over the sea at an altitude of about 35,000 feet at almost 500 knots. Some say that it might be an AN-12 returning from an exercise in the Barents Sea, but the leadership isn't convinced that this is an AN-12. The plane is too high and too fast for it to be an AN-12. Someone else suggests that this might be a TU-95 from the Naval Reconnaissance Division. Someone gets on the phone with the Naval Reconnaissance Bureau. Nope, they didn't have any planes on approach. As Captain Alexander Bozov closes the gap between him and the bogey, Captain Bozov radios back to base that he sees an RC-135, an American plane that was used for reconnaissance. On the part of Captain Alexander, this was an honest mistake. The RC-135 was based on the 707 and does resemble the 707 quite a bit. In the dim dark light of his fighter interceptor, it's easy to see how Captain Alexander got confused. He also says that he saw what appeared to be a maple leaf on the tail of the plane. 
I imagine that this caused a bit of commotion back in Moscow. If what they were hearing were true, this meant that a NATO plane was ingressing into Soviet airspace as they talked. Captain Kim sees the Su-15 and slows down, and he turns his landing lights on. It's pretty clear that the fighter wants the plane to follow him. The transmissions by Captain Kim expressing his willingness to follow the fighter were recorded by Finnish ATC. But as the Su-15 pulls up closer to the plane, Captain Alexander realizes his mistake. The plane was in fact a passenger airliner. He radios back to his base that the plane has Chinese markings on it and that the tail has a red stork and not a maple leaf. He tries to convince his superiors on the ground that this was a passenger plane. Here's where the story of the two sides diverge. Captain Kim is ready to land, but the Soviets say that the plane made a hard right turn in an attempt to reach Finnish airspace. The Soviets knew that if the plane was making a break for Finnish airspace, they wouldn't have much time. The plane would be in Finnish airspace in about six minutes. The superiors are briefed that the plane is escaping to Finland. With this information, the final order was given. Destroy the violator of the Soviet Union air border with a volley. The Americans had intercepted all of this radio chatter. Captain Alexander tries to convince his superiors that this is a passenger plane, but they've made up their mind. Captain Alexander pulls the speed brakes to put some distance between him and the plane. With orders to destroy the plane, Captain Alexander ripple fires two R-60 heat-seeking missiles. The first missile doesn't track and misses the plane entirely. The second missile, however, tracks true and hits the edge of the left wing of the 707. The missile shears off three to four meters of the tip of the left wing and takes out engine number one. The plane banks left and begins to spiral down. The crew was doing an emergency descent. As the plane plunged, the three meter piece of the wing was picked up by Soviet radars. The Soviets are still under the impression that this was a NATO warplane and they saw a small object come off the plane. They assumed that it was a cruise missile. The plane had gotten off before the missiles hit. The Soviet ground controllers talked to Sergei Slobodchikov, another pilot in the Su-15 flight. They asked Sergei to shoot down the wing debris and he does. The fighters were now running low on fuel and they were asked to return to base. As all of this happened, the 707 had fallen so much that it had dropped off of Soviet radars. But the plane was still airborne despite having lost one of its engines and a major portion of its wing. The 707 was still flying. Captain Kim wanted to set the plane down and he did not know how long the plane would be aloft for. Back in the Soviet camp, the Su-15 flight tells him that they had lost the 707 and that they could not find the crash site, knowing that the plane might still be in Soviet airspace. They scramble another jet. As the first Su-15 flight returned, Anatoly Kravov was scrambled in an attempt to find the missing plane. Ground control asks him to fly a heading of 140 at 1600 feet. Anatoly finds the plane flying on a 270 heading. Ground control asks him to come up closer for an inspection to see if the plane was in fact the one that they were looking for. The 707 turns around and now is flying straight into the heart of the Soviet Union. Ground control asks Anatoly to guide the plane to the Afrikandas airbase, but Captain Kim of the 707 was looking for a clearing on which he could put his jumbo jet down. Anatoly thinks to himself, he's unsure of how to proceed in flight training, they did interception in groups, but up here today, he was all alone. The plane looks like a 707, but he knows that NATO has a multitude of aircraft that is based on the 707. Anatoly wonders what he'd do if the 707 opened fire on him. But orders are orders. Anatoly pulls up closer to the stricken plane. He pulls up to the left of the plane and flies in front of the 707 in the direction of the Afrikanda airbase. The airbase where he wanted the 707 to land. But nothing. The 707 did not comply. Anatoly tried three more times, but Captain Kim didn't bite. Captain Kim had fought MiGs in the Korean War, so he probably knew what the Soviets wanted him to do. 
but maybe he did not want to follow the Soviet fighter, or he just couldn't. Fed up with this, Anatoly pulls back. He radios to base. If it doesn't fulfill the commands, let me destroy the target. But ground control asks him to stand down. Soon, a vast white expanse comes into view. Anatoly realized what Captain Kim was trying to do. He was going to try to land his wounded plane on the frozen Lake Karelia. Anatoly watched as the plane went lower and lower and lower, so low that he could not keep up. The 707 hits the ice and skids along the ice on its belly for about 300 meters and comes to rest near the shore of the frozen lake. Anatoly reports that the plane was not on fire and was still in one piece. In a brilliant show of airmanship, the crew of the 707 managed to land the stricken plane on a frozen lake and the plane was more or less intact. The only casualties in the entire ordeal were the two people on Flight 902 who were killed when the missile exploded near the wing. On the 23rd of April, the passengers were handed over to the American consulate in Leningrad. But why had the plane flown so badly off course? The plane basically turned around and flew back without the crew realizing it. Flying this close to the North Pole probably messed with the plane's navigational instruments. We can't be certain though. After the crash, the Soviets confiscated the black boxes and refused access to them. This was the era before INS and GPS. With how homogenous the terrain is in the Arctic, they might not have any visual cues about where they were going. With the Soviets dismantling the plane, and with there being some rumors that they were trying to reverse engineer the plane, and with no black boxes, the magnetic interference hypothesis seems to be the most likely culprit for the navigational error. But the true tragedy here is that no one really learned from their lesson. Mistakes were made in navigation and also in the interception of the airplane. The Soviets should have put in place a more coherent plan to intercept unknown airplanes in its airspace. Five years later, with the rules being overhauled for even more security, the Soviets would shoot down Korean Airlines Flight 007. This time, the plane wouldn't be so lucky, killing 269. I can't help but wonder if this disaster could have been avoided had the Soviets just learned their lesson. Thank you for watching another episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. A big thank you to Curious Plane Spotter for letting me use his amazing videos on my video. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. I'll catch you guys next time.